Welcome everyone to the fourth episode of Neo Reality Podcast. I'm I'm Neo Reality, and I'm with all, a very no, well known Twitter user on WWE, for the WWE who likes to make a lot of commentary on the WWE programming, and in my opinion, does better than the actual commentator from time to time. Alexander the Great, who is the mayor of Full Throttle City. So, do you want to introduce yourself? Good, I mean, yeah, good evening. It's me, Alexander the Great. The guy who takes the WWE Universe to full throttle city. I'm also considered one of the biggest, I'm also considered the biggest Alexa Bliss fan. Yep, and Five Feet of Fury, she's she's doing great in, on, in WWE, in my opinion, and in a lot of people's opinion. Except for that This Is Your Life segment, that did not work so well. Um, um, I heard many people weren't that receptive to that um, segment called Bailey, This Is Your Life. Some people weren't receptive to it. Yeah, I didn't like it. I was like... Okay, it only worked once with The Rock and McFoley. You can't make it work again. And especially when they tried to do it again with The Rock and McFoley and John Cena, and that and that didn't work for me. As far as I was concerned, The Rock and McFoley were the only guys who um, I mean, who did it better than anybody else could. Yep, and they went into overtime and Vince was reportedly mad about that. So today we we're going to discuss about our experience our experience with the wrestling industry and my guy's been a wild ride. Um, it says on your Twitter profile, Alex, Alex, that um you've been a huge wrestling fan since 1997. That's I mean that's correct. Since I was uh, two years old, going on three. All right, I didn't get into wrestling. I was born a year after you. And, and four days earlier, a year and four days earlier, um, I was born in 1995, August 14th, and you were born on August 18th, 1994, so I was born a month before the Monday Night War started, and to be sad about this, and I can't believe I'm going to say this, I missed the entire party. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, I missed the entire party, the Attitude Era, the NWO. I didn't know what wrestling was until I was until the year 2001, and by then WCW was out of business, ECW was out of business, and by then WWE was in the Invasion storyline. And my first experience with it was seeing The Rock and Chris Jericho tag team. I don't remember against who, but I do remember The Rock and Chris Jericho on Monday Night Raw. Oh, I mean, oh yeah. I mean, I mean, those were the days. Uh, those were the days. Yo, I mean, you won't get any days like this again. Yeah, it, it was it was sad when I when I looked up about what was the attitude. I was like, I miss this. Curse you, timing, and. I was like, but now, like, the power of the internet, it makes it much easier to go back and relive all that er glorious days and see what was great, what wasn't great. The Attitude Era, as much as people praise it as the greatest era in WWE, I kind of thought, like, maybe you're kind of saying it's a little too perfect because there were flaws in it, like modern WWE, except those flaws just weren't as noticeable. I mean, yeah. I mean, everybody has, I mean, different opinions of, um, about about a a any era. No matter if it's new new generation or attitude or ruthless aggression or PG era. Yeah, and I went and in 2000, my first ever pay per view I ever watched on television was Vengeance 2001, where Chris Jericho won the Undisputed Championship, being both The Rock and Steve Austin. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah when I, when I was watched, I was, I mean, I was kind of shocked. That 
once that happened be the first time I'd ever seen somebody beat two separate champions in one night. Yeah. Um, yeah. I I was I like I said I wasn't a wrestling fan until 2001, and by then the Invasion storyline had officially ended, and then I um, fully watched WWE after Vengeance 2001. And I had heard originally, um, this might cu- this might not surprise a lot of people, but I'm more, but if people have seen my YouTube videos regarding wrestling, they would know I'm like I used to be this big wide-eyed WWE fan, and then I became more cynical with WWE, especially how they like to book things. Like, what was your first experience when you encountered the famously known as the IWC? Oh, <laughs> well, I mean, uh, well, my, well, my opinion is, I mean, I mean, WWE with whatever, I mean, with whatever stuff they're trying to pull, um, I mean, you, I mean, you, I mean, you can see that there are, that, that there are a lot of fans who notice what the problems are within the, I mean, the WWE system. I mean, you know, um, yeah, I mean, you know, that there are a lot more rumors and, and knowledge about backstage politics right now compared to 10 years ago. Yeah. Um, 10 years ago, you didn't you didn't really learn about any of this stuff. In fact, even back th- even during the attitude era and ruthless aggression era, you didn't learn that much about backstage politics. And then like around 2005, you started to hear words going on backstage, but when you had to hear what goes on backstage, it's when a wrestler went on the mic and just said whatever he or she wanted without caring about whether or not they lose their job. And the most famous one has to be Vince Russo when he went off on Hulk Hogan at Bash of the Beach 2000. Well, I have to admit, I hadn't heard about backstage politics up until about 2006 or seven. All right. That, I mean, that that was when I started to get uh, knowledge, more, more knowledge in depth about how wrestling works. Yeah. I mean, I, that that was when I found out that these guys weren't um, saying anything. I mean, eighty percent of the time, these guys are scripted. Um, these eighty percent of that, um, the time, these guys are given some sort of script where they had to um say what was on uh paper or something yeah they had to say what was on paper yeah and honestly when i had learned about this like i started getting more knowledgeable with the wrestling business um sometime when okay do you remember the nexus uh, i mean uh, oh yes i do i i i, 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 I remember not just the attack on John Cena, they attacked CM Punk. It was also the same thing where Dale Bryan strangled Justin Roberts with his own necktie. Yeah, he got fired for that. Yes, he did. Yeah, and I was and like, I, okay. I, at first, I thought that was part of the, I thought that was part of the act. Yeah. You see, the storyline did call for that, but when people were being a little oversensitive about the whole thing, saying, oh, it's too violent for our PG audience, and then WWE felt like they had no choice and just fired him, and I thought, okay, so let's see if I get this straight. Daniel Bryan choking a guy that you told him to do is perfectly against, is against the law in your mind, but yet Roman Reigns gets to go ahead and attempt murder on Braun Strowman at Great Balls of Fire, and that's perfectly okay with your audience, according to you at least. Well, well, I have to say that, um, Se- I mean, seven years ago, WWE was um, somewhat strictly PG. It, I mean, it wasn't that it wasn't that lenient at the time. I mean, um, I'm just, I mean, the stuff the stuff that you said in the Attitude Era, you, 
you can't you can't say you can't say anymore. Yeah, and I get why they didn't want to say that. They had sponsors and everything was more, and a lot of people became more, um, let's see, what's the word I'm looking for? Politically correct on everything. I mean, like, when you hear that people got mad over Wonder Woman not having armpit hair in a trailer, and that offends people, I'm like, okay, you lost me. Where was the logic in that? Yeah, I'm not kidding about that though. Like, I I plan to talk about Wonder Woman in a future thoughts video, but like, I see where you're from. what? I said I see where you're coming from. Yeah, and when the Nexus angle happened and everything was all red hot for those guys, SummerSlam happened, and that was the death death toll for them. When John Cena beat both. Justin, just, uh, Justin Gabriel and Wade Barrett after being DDT through concrete, and everyone immediately called BS on that. Uh, I mean, to be honest, uh, I, I thought that. I mean, uh, I, I have to agree with you. I, I thought that moment had to be a little inconceived because I thought WWE was was actually gonna make stars in a in a nexus, but but instead it just went downhill from there. Yeah. Okay, if you haven't heard this, but here's what I'm about to tell you. Okay. Um Edge and Chris Jericho were on a podcast many years after the Nexus angle ended, and they had revealed that this was the original plan. The Nexus were supposed to win at SummerSlam. However, the one person no one expected to actually change the ending was John Cena. Yeah. John Cena had changed the ending to the SummerSlam match. And... Then he said afterwards to Edge and Jericho, when he said beforehand, he told them, oh, this would be a good idea. This would put these guys over. This is going to make them look strong. And then afterwards, he realized what he had done and said, yeah, I screwed up big time. And I'm like, okay, okay, he's, he admit he's wrong. Okay, can he fix this whole thing? Like, I'm pretty sure he can fix it. And he never fixed it. He never owned up to that. And like, what was your reaction? So, so he actually admitted that he that he kind of flipped the script. Well, John Cena never admitted it. He tries to like recently when someone called him out on that, they said he just tried to circle around that and not try to talk about it. But Edge and Jericho, who have been known to be very honest when it comes to the wrestling business, they kind of admitted, yeah, Cena changed the script. And then Wade Barrett had said that they were supposed to go over, but however, Vince McMahon made the excuse saying, Oh, SummerSlam needed a happy ending, and Wade Barrett said, yeah, he's lying. Vince is lying. And then every single member of the Nexus, with the exception of Brian, um, have said that John Cena had something to do with changing the script. Well, well, here's, uh, well, well, that's where the, the planning for yeah. It was it was just when I had learned this, I was like, okay, I kind of lost respect for Cena a bit. Like I respect what he's done for this business, but when he starts changing matches, like Hulk Hogan used to do a lot back then when he was, you know, running around with WWE and Hulkamania and then Hollywood Hulk Hogan and WCW. It sort of made me start thinking like, yeah, I think this fame might be getting to Cena's head. I mean, I mean, yeah, it, 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 there are times where it gets to 
anybody says, especially when when you're considered a top superstar of an era. Yeah, and that led to me starting to become a little critical with John Cena a lot. Like, I started not liking the way he would just shrug things off or make jokes about something when something serious is supposed to happen. Like, the Wyatt family. Um, do you remember, like, after Brock Lesnar had beat John Cena at rest, at SummerSlam for the WWE Championship in a stunning fashion? Oh, oh. Oh, yes. Yeah, that that was awesome. Okay, remember how the two weeks later he took on Bray Wyatt and then he for some reason destroyed all three members? Yep. Uh, yeah. Um, yep. Yeah, here's the thing. Vince McMahon had made that decision. He originally was going to have Bray Wyatt destroy the big show and come out looking strong. But, but Vince being so stuck in this loop of John Cena is pretty much God to WWE, in my mind at least. I, like, all due respect to Vince, like, I respect Vince a lot, but I have been critical of his recent actions in recent years, feeling like he might be going senile of age. And he changed the ending where he said, Oh, the, the kids will lose faith in Cena. We can't have that. His merchandise will go down, and therefore the kids will lose faith in him since he lost to Brock Lesnar. We gotta make him look strong. Well, well, well see, here's the thing. I, 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 I think Vince is doing this to get... Uh, more, I mean, more, more, more and more sponsors, more and more uh, children, uh, children to watch. I, I, I understand that Vince's job is to keep Cena marketable, but, but there, but there, but it could also be at other superstars' expense. Yeah, and that really aggravated me. Like, for years, I believe Cena might be Hulk Hogan 2.0, where he basically would screw anybody over who tries to get to a certain level and then just slam the glass ceiling on them. And then I started thinking lately, okay, say, let's say if Cena isn't really the backstage politician we all perceive him as. Instead, what if he's just complicit to whatever Vince McMahon tells him to do and doesn't speak out against him? Like... Cena had, like Cena has been known to have some po- sort of pull backstage, but for some reason he will not stand up to Vince, even though Vince, since Vince has protected him for so long and has kept him at this position at the top, Vince can't really fire him, or else he'll take his talent and go somewhere else, or go to Hollywood. Uh, uh, see, this, this is, uh, this could be one of the primary reasons why a lot of people would consider Vince McMahon to be kind of senile and um, uh, and out of touch. I, I I don't I don't think he's listening to what Vince truly want. Yeah, I can see that. And then you look at NXT, and here's a question. What do you ultimately think of Triple H's NXT since Triple H kind of runs the show? Well, well, well Triple H did. Um, well, first let me tell you about NXT. First, NXT was supposed to be this this hybrid between reality and professional uh, wrestling where where, where there were about seven or eight superstars who were trying to become the WWE's breakout star. This happened between 2010 and 2012. But, uh, but But after Triple H... Uh, went from a full-time wrestler 
to uh, to a suit where a guy who works in an office. That was when NXT started to change. That was when we started to see the perception of that was when the perception of Russell started to really change. He started building n- newer and newer stars. A- N- NXT is praised a lot more than the main roster. Yeah. And NXT, especially after what happened at the last TakeOver, everyone said that show was the best NXT TakeOver since our evolution. And they looked at SummerSlam and says, oh, you guys got to catch up. Like, man, the developmental center is kicking your butt. And I'm pretty sure Vince was not happy about that. I mean... There have been times where people who were very popular and over with the audience on NXT can, I mean, can can get can get their characters and and reputations destroyed when they're on the main roster. Yeah. Um, okay. I know some people might pin the blame on Vince, and they might be right on that. But at the same time. Part of me gets the feeling like someone is telling him to do all this damage. And there's one guy that everyone likes to point the finger at. And his name is Kevin Dunn. Well. (laughs) Well, I... Well... I, 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 I do my best I, I do my best not to uh, I mean not not to speculate because well because I do my best not to I mean not to speculate who is responsible for for the superstars who were popular NXT yet as some people like to call it, buried on a main roster. I, I, I don't I don't know if it's Kevin Dunn. I, I, I don't know if it's Vince Man. I, I, I just don't know if it could be a member of the WWE's creative team because I've seen somewhere at the source where WWE creative team writes some writes some uh they write some content for their wrestlers, then they pitch the ideas to Triple H, and then he pitches the ideas to Vince, who makes the final decision prior to the show beginning. Yeah, and sometimes it has been known that Vince likes to rewrite the show like hours before the show actually starts. And that has led to some bad episodes of Raw and SmackDown at times. Back before SmackDown started the brand extension again. But Vince... Like, Vince has said numerous times in interviews that he will not sur- he will not give up his position as the leader of WWE until he's dead on the chair. And I always felt like, dude... Um, a lot of people said the same thing about Ric Flair, how he's kind of damaged his legacy to some people, even though I personally don't feel like Ric Flair's legacy was damaged, and I hear, and also, shout out to the Nature Boy, I really hope, we really hope you get better, because of his health scare he's going through, but when Ric Flair started overstaying his welcome in wrestling, a lot of people started losing interest in him, and I get the feeling that people might be that people are starting to feel more and more resentful towards Vince's overstaying in the business and not wanting to step down and let the younger guys to take over the business, like Triple H. Like, how do you I find all say, that? Well, I have to say Triple H, um, and, and Triple H, Vince run, uh, two, I mean, two very different capacities in WWE. For example, Triple H runs NXT, this man runs the, I mean, the, the main 
roster, and and this is part where it's very sad. I mean, there. I mean, there are some people in NXT who were able to survive on the main roster. Like, for example, let's take Neville. For example, Neville, the two-time cruiserweight champion, when when he first arrived on the main roster, that was months after he lost the NXT championship to Sami Zayn. Uh, it, I mean, at, at first, uh, his character was this um, generic, high-flying good guy who who didn't. I mean, who who didn't say much? He just let his aerial high-flying moves do all the talking for him. Then, then about a, a year later, they they had Neville turn into turn into a bitter a bitter egotistical bad guy who who considered him I mean who said that the fans took pity on him because uh, because he was small and vulnerable but he said that wouldn't happen anymore that was when he had this new attitude just when we thought Neville would be lost in a shuffle he's found his calling yeah it just took two years for them to realize that And then we got Seth Rollins, who has done exceptionally well on the main roster. And then when his WWE Championship reign happened, his first WWE title reign happened, it was mixed at best. I thought it was not a good title reign because of how weak he was being booked. Instead of being the Seth Rollins that would threaten to cripple Edge on television just to get the authority back or be strong enough to take on Brock Lesnar, I thought... Why is Seth Rollins being booked like this as WWE Champion? It kind of waters it down and makes him look really weak. And cowardly. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I actually wanted to see the Seth... I mean, this... I actually wanted to see the Seth Rollins in him when he was Mr. Money in a Bank. Yeah. But I, mean, I I don't I, I, mean, I sorry sorry I interrupted sorry. No 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 that's all right I mean yeah if something you want to get off your chest you can do it. Oh I was gonna say yeah everyone wanted to see Mister Money in the Bank Seth Rollins back as WWE champion but we never got that we instead got this weaker cowardly over relying on people Seth Rollins and then just stabbing him in the back whenever he felt like it. Even though the logic makes no sense, because if he was booked stronger and did the same thing, that would make sense because he felt confident in his abilities. But even he admitted that, yeah, I don't feel confident in my abilities to fight Brock Lesnar, even though just months ago I had the gall to t- to stand up to him. Uh, yep, I mean, Seth Rollins isn't the only example they, uh, that WWE has done especially after turning your your stars in, into heels and making them champions. Um, oh, I, 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 I think here, here, here's the part. The cowardly heel gets all, overused too much. They did that with him. Uh, they've, they've done that with The Miz. They did it with, with AJ Lee after she won the Divas Championship. I wonder why why they have to do that. I mean, with everybody who was a bad guy at the time. I mean, you get some bad guys who are cowardly, and you would get some who are dominant. I mean, Brock Les Brock Lesnar's been a been a heel before, but he hasn't been booked as a happy. Yeah, he hasn't been booked like that before. Even back then, 10 years ago, when the booking style was different, when wrestlers were allowed to be more creative in themselves. But now, Brock Lesnar's a part-timer, and he just came off of UFC, so WWE felt like they had no choice but to make him look like this badass, intimidating force. Yep. They're also doing it with uh, 
Braun Strowman. Yeah, and everyone remembers Braun Strowman being a rosebud before he became Braun Strowman, and I thought that's still hilarious. But Braun Strowman, yeah, he's possibly like okay. I always felt like there's always they could balance the cowardly heel and the and the intimidating force if they did it right, like they did with Edge back then. But I get that booking differences happened back then to now, and the fact Edge was a top star already by the time WWE started watering down on the on the more younger heels. But it always bugged me the wrong way how WWE liked to make a make a strong superstar heel, and then when he wins the world title or in Kevin Owens' case the Universal title, they immediately start weakening them and making them over rely on people. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I, I forgot to mention Kevin Owens. Since since Kevin Owens won a universal title, um, they they kind of stripped him of his redeeming qualities. Kevin Owens was supposed to be Kevin Owens was supposed to be a rabid wrestler uh, who attacked. Who attack? Who who attack people mercilessly, just just so he could earn money and put food on the table. Yes, that was NXT Kevin Owens. WWE Kevin Owens says, "No, we can't make Kevin Owens look like a sympathetic person. We need to make him look like a bad guy because the kids will not know any different." At least that's how I saw it. Yep, Kevin Owens once said he'd fight, he'd fight just about, he'd fight just about anybody. Yeah, and when I hear when I saw NXT and I saw Kevin Owens explain his motives to go after Sami Zayn for the NXT title, I thought, oh my god, that's actually a really good motivation and not a generic heel motivation. But when we got him on the main roster. He was doing that initially when he went after Ryback for the Intercontinental Championship. But after that, it just disappeared. And I'm like, really? Like, does the management in WWE believe that if kids hear complex reasonings, they're going to damage their brains somehow? I feel like WWE is trying to be overprotective, yet uncaring at the same time when it comes to their fan base. Like, Kevin Owens fighting for his family... Oh, no, that's bad. But Roman Reigns attempting to murder Braun Strowman with an ambulance truck and a semi-truck, yeah, that's okay. Uh, I, I think WWE isn't doing the right thing by by turning Roman Reigns heel because a, 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 lot, of fans, a lot of fans feel strongly up, about him being pushed too early. A lot of fans feel strongly about that. Yeah, and, okay, here's the thing I like to say. I am a huge fan of Roman Reigns, but even I'll admit his character needs a major overhaul, or you could just turn him heel, but here's the thing. Roman Reigns had to work three years before he became WWE Champion, but fans seem to have forgotten Brock Lesnar... It only took him four months to become WWE Champion. Yeah, I, I still don't get that logic. Oh, 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 yeah, you're, you're, you're right about, you're right about, uh, well, we'll, we'll see, uh, Roman Reigns and Brock Lesnar have two different they, they have two different characters. Yeah. Like, initially, WWE did look like they were making Roman Reigns a Brock Lesnar to an extent, like an opposite of John Cena. Like, whereas John Cena was goofy, happy, go lucky, and would fall for any trap that I heal for some strange reason, Roman Reigns was cold and calculating, but when people started cheering for Reigns and WWE saw something in him, they started making him a John Cena clone and that's when everything started falling apart. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's the thing. When they start 
trying to get the heel towards the good guy level. I mean, a, 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 lot, a lot of fans can't perceive doing uh, baby face acts as and very, and very unoriginal. Because, well, but, but when you're a heel, you get to have more, you get to have more freedom. Yeah, like Chris Jericho in WCW. Remember when he was this happy-go-lucky good guy, and then when he turned heel in 98, he became awesome in WCW until the Goldberg debacle. Yeah. Yeah, I felt like he's the perfect example. Chris Jericho's just awesome. Let me tell you about Seth Rollins' face turn. I thought Seth Rollins, I thought Seth Rollins sh- uh, should have turned face immediately after he returned from his uh, knee injury. Uh, but, but instead, they kept him heel and, and Roman Reigns a, a, a face, which got a lot of uh, reaction from the crowd. I thought they were actually uh, going to turn Seth Rollins' face and Roman Reigns' heel. Yeah. I, like, before Money in the Bank, I was hoping for that too. But then Dudley said, no, we're not doing it because um, we might secretly hate you fans who want actual good stuff going on. In fact, here's the thing. Before had Seth Rollins gotten injured at before Survivor Series back in 2015... There was a report that came out that some producer in WWE wanted to do a double turn on the same night at that pay-per-view to akin similar to Bret Hart and Stone Cold Steve Austin. Roman Reigns returned to the dark side, Seth Rollins returned to the good side, and that I mean, that idea was shot down like almost immediately by Vince McMahon. Well, the, the, the unfortunate uh, truth is uh, Vince is the boss. Um, that, that, that's a cold hard fact about the company. You no, know, he's not. Uh, uh, I, 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 I wouldn't say I wouldn't say he's that open minded. He's not he's not that enthusiastic about testing waters to see how it actually turns out. Uh, I mean, uh, the, a lot of writers are employed uh, in, in a company. Uh, superstars should really be given uh, given more freedom to to let their characters shine the shine the way they want their characters. I mean, superstars should have more freedom to have their characters shine. They they shouldn't be forced. I mean, they shouldn't be forced to say um, anything that's written down on paper. Uh, um, I don't mind if the creative team gives them a few pointers, but a lot of rock, a lot of hell should should start attempting to sound more authentic. I agree. Like in NXT, it has been reported at least. The NXT operates a lot differently than the main roster in terms of its creative department. Like, the writers do come up with ideas and concepts, but they ultimately give the wrestlers a bullet point list to say, okay, here's the things that you need to address in your promo, but other than that, just say whatever you want in order to get to these points. Yeah, that's what I felt like what made NXT so successful was this creative freedom they gave. Yeah. Uh, um, but here's the thing. Uh, that, it somewhat changed when WWE brought back the brand extension last year. Uh, did you think it had a positive or a negative effect on, on NXT? Oh, the brand flip, the brand extension. Yeah, um, 
Okay, here, okay, I don't really watch the tapings of NXT because I'm spoiled about it anyways, but I do try to look at the clips and whatnot, and I feel like it's more like a mixed bag. Like, NXT, like, when I heard this brand extension, I also was concerned about NXT, about whether or not a lot of their talent was going to be taken, and therefore it would be crippled. But at the same time, we had breakout stars like Eric Young of Sanity. We got Nikki Cross doing the crazy gimmick uh, in a much more almost insane asylum way. We got Asuka, who just recently relinquished the Women's Championship at NXT taping because she wants to explore the main roster now. And when I heard that, I was like, oh, uh, that's not a good thing. Oh, and let's not forget Ember Moon. Like she, like she's been able to be more open with herself. Uh, a lot of other wrestlers in NXT still have still have this vibe, like they're allowed to be who they want to be and not be told by management that oh, you can't say this, you can't say this, you can't say that. But I felt like there were some key restrictions, but they weren't like overly restricted, like WWE main roster likes to do. But yeah, I felt like it's more like a mixed bag depending on how you view NXT after the brand extension happened. So, ultimately, it's subjective for me. Well, uh, well, well here's this happened. Uh, the glorious Bobby Roode is now on SmackDown Live. This happened just days after he lost the NXT championship to Drew McIntyre. Yep. Um, I, I'm kind of, I'm kind of concerned about what they might do with with his glorious character. I, I'm just hoping he's able to do what he was allowed to do when he was an NXT superstar. Yeah. Um. I hope so too. But when I saw that promo he cut after his match with Aiden English, I was immediately concerned. It was a generic face promo with just the word "glorious" in it. And then a report came out that WWE originally wanted to make him replace Baron Corbin as the top heel, but then it changed their minds and says, "No, he's going to be a good guy. He's going to be our top face of SmackDown." Bobby Roode was doing a really good job as as the heel. I mean, at, at NXT. Now all of a sudden, they won't let him. They won't let him keep it. Well, if they were in terms of a good guy, I just hope he keeps a lot of the heel characteristics because because that happened. This this happened with. Uh, uh, let, let me tell you, for example, a lot of good guys that will not, that will not keep their bad guy um, uh, characteristics include. Stone Cold Steve Austin, uh, Ric Flair, the late Eddie Guerrero. Yeah, like, they were able to keep it, but at the same time, that was from a different era of wrestling when creative freedom was more allowed and the wrestlers were allowed to express themselves. But here in today's WWE, it's more restrictive and more constricting of your creativity and... I think that's the major concern when it comes to Asuka and Bobby Roode who are going to be moving to the main roster and explore the opportunities there. And, yeah, it's just a bad situation for me. Uh, 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 yeah, I, I mean, I have, to level, I have to level with you. I don't I, I don't like how this is going. I mean, for either, I mean, for either of them. Uh, I, 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 I have to think what they also did with Baron Corbin. I mean, was was too early. They they they, they should have waited on that money in the bank cash opportunity a little longer. Yeah, speaking of Baron Corbin, like the guy, feel like he has potential. But here's the thing. He apparently angered some people backstage when he insulted Dave Meltzer. And I had said this in a build-up to SummerSlam video that I was confused by this because I thought Vince and management of all people would not like Dave Meltzer because he gives away big information about WWE management in the backstage behind the scenes. So I thought, that's confusing, but okay. Like, Baron Corbin's being punished accordingly. 
But then a report came out that the reason why Barry Corbin lost at SummerSlam wasn't because of Dave Meltzer's comments he made. It was because John Cena said, oh, he's not ready. And I was angered by that because I was thinking, once again, why does John Cena have this authority? He can't just decide whether a guy is ready or not because they can say the same thing about Ginger Mahal as WWE Champion. But I felt like that should be up to management, not to the wrestler who shouldn't have a pull backstage. Uh, I mean, well, I mean, well, well, this is where it gets me. I, I, I don't think any wrestler, regardless uh, if you're on top or not, should have uh, should have any input in determining what whether an upcoming superstar, whether an upcoming superstar is is ready or isn't ready. And and I think that's what John Cena needs to know. That's what that's what any uh, superstar uh, or who's the fitter on the top of the mountain needs to know. Yeah, and John Cena was asked about this question. A lot of people went and criticized John Cena for basically screwing Barry Corbin's career over. And John Cena responded, but he acted all smiley and happy about it. Like, oh, it just makes me motivated. It just keeps me stronger. It makes me more smiling. Like, dude, this is a legitimate criticism that you're having this authority backstage where you basically say, that guy's not ready. That guy is ready. I want to screw this guy over big time and ruin them because... Cena, you're set for life. John Cena is set for life. He has all the money, all the talent. He has all this glorious privileges he's gotten thanks to his time at the top. And now he doesn't want to give back to that. He doesn't want to put these guys over unless he's forced to by either Road Dog or SmackDown Live, the writers of SmackDown Live, unless he's ordered to because, well... I don't know. It's like John Cena and Vince don't like when someone gets over and they have to be screwed over. Unless they, you know, unless it's Vince McMahon's desire to see Roman Reigns, and that's a completely different story. I mean, well. Would you say the same thing about uh, Randy Orton? Because like like John Cena, he's been he's been there for for fifteen years. Yeah, I would say the same thing to Randy Orton. Like there has been known incidents regarding Randy Orton's attitude with people. I don't know if that's still the case now, but I seriously thought Bray Wyatt should have won at WrestleMania thirty three. That. That match was horrible, but I felt like Bray Wyatt should have won that because he has finally been given this huge break from all the screw job by the creative team. And when he finally got to the top, he was finally WWE champion, and I was so proud of him. And it's taken away from him just a month later. And he's back to where he started. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, I, I I really think that people on top should I mean should should put the younger superstars more over a lot more often than than they do nowadays. I mean, it, I, I, I don't think I don't think it's gonna dis, I, I don't think it's gonna destroy the reputation of I mean of the top guys. I mean. It, it's about it's about giving it's about giving the, the new crop of talent an opportunity. Yeah, like it, I mean, yeah, it, I agree. It, it's it's about seeing what what they can really do. Yeah, and when I think of guys who want to give back to the people, to the younger guys. I think of Daniel Bryan because he did not care about all this fame and glory. He wanted to just wrestle and put people over and make them look as strong as possible for them to have a bigger future. And I also think of The Undertaker because he was he was the cornerstone. He stayed in WWE. He was WWE for life. 
And he could have just abused that power and got anything he wanted out of it. But he decided, you know what? I'm going to share all this. I'm going to give it to Stone Cold Steve Austin. I'm going to give it to Triple H. I'm going to give it to The Rock. I'm going to give it to all these other talented guys because they have an op because they should have the opportunity. And I also think of Terry Funk back in ECW when he put all these wrestlers over and he got this huge reward by Paul Heyman. Yeah, I, I believe that's one of the main reasons why a lot of people respect The Undertaker. They they, they don't speak ill of him. Yeah, and when The Undertaker retired, here's the thing. I had been, after WrestleMania 30, I had been lobbying for The Undertaker to stop wrestling. Not because of anything that was wrong, but I felt like his health should have been taken into more consideration. Like, during his match with Brock Lesnar... Five minutes into the match, he gets a concussion. And he almost gets his neck broken by Brock Lesnar. I don't care. I don't know if it was intentional or not. I'm pretty sure it was not intentional. But I felt like, yeah, Undertaker, I feel like you should stop at this point. Like, you're at an age where your body's not as strong as it used to be. And then he came back and wrestled. And then came back again. with, And he fought Brock Lesnar again. And I started thinking WWE... Like, wow, you're just going to milk The Undertaker until, what, he's in a wheelchair at this point? Like, I felt like they were asking too much for him at this point. And then they book him in a Hell in a Cell match with Brock Lesnar again. And I'm thinking, like, oh, God, could you just stop him? Just tell him to stop. I know Undertaker wants to give back, but I feel like he needs to stop. You need to tell him to stop wrestling or his health is going to be very in danger. And then he came back again to fight Shane McMahon in Hell in a Cell. And I was glad Undertaker wasn't hurt that time. But when Roman Reigns came around and was going to fight The Undertaker, I was like, please let this be Undertaker's last match. Because it's been said that that Undertaker was in need of a hip replacement surgery and he has been delaying it for two years. And I was saying, like, if this is his last match, please let it be his final match. I want him to walk on his own terms. I mean, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I felt, I felt like he should have the you know, surgery because, uh, 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 because the last few, few times he, he was walking, I, I felt he was he was kind of limping. He was off balance. I thought, I mean, I thought he needs surgery. I don't, think, I, I, don't I, I don't think it's just rushing that can hold his body. It, it could be life outside of wrestling, too. Yeah, but, but everyone had said the same thing. Undertaker wrestling for so long, and the fact that he has been injured numerous times and came back to work the next night, that was a huge factor in it. And I felt like, Undertaker, you've given enough. Like, you just have to stop. And when he finally retired, hopefully... Because there were rumors circulating that he was coming back for SummerSlam to fight Roman Reigns again. And I was like, no! No, I will not see this. I will not stand for this. I will not want The Undertaker to be in a wheelchair because Vince McMahon asked too much from him. Well, well I was happy. I was happy Undertaker, I mean, didn't come back. I... I mean, I, I don't mind if Undertaker makes special appearances, but not for wrestling. Yeah, like, they could, like, I'm hoping they do the Hall of Fame induction for him and do it in a glamorous way that just, just sells that The Undertaker will forever be WWE. But if he was to come back for one more match, I would say no. Like... This isn't like The Rock. This isn't like Stone Cold. Well, to an extent, it is like Stone Cold because he has he has been known to have neck and spine issues over the years after the Owen Hart incident. Um, and this isn't like the game Triple H. This isn't like Kurt Angle. But The Undertaker, his health can't keep going. Especially if WWE books him in these, in these no disqualification matches. Well, well, I, well, well. I think they did. I think that they 
they did the right thing because Undertaker's retirement should have should have come a lot sooner than WrestleMania 33. Yeah. Like, it really should have ended at WrestleMania 30, and then, okay, if he wanted to come back for one more match, and I would have preferred, if he did come back for one more match, he would have put Bray Wyatt over at WrestleMania 31, and then walk into the, walk off into the sunset, and drive off into the sunset, he just put over the guy who made people believe is his successor, in terms of the character, and I felt like, yeah, that would be the best way to end it, but they didn't do that. Yeah, and, and, I mean, uh, instead they make they made a they made a joke out of Bray Wyatt on that day. There is another factor. Reportedly, Bray Wyatt had sprained his ankle badly before the show, so I get the feeling that's why the match wasn't as good as it could have been. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, I mean, health should be health should be prioritized a lot more in the company. Yeah. And then there's Daniel Bryan. Like, remember, like, how did you feel when you when he had announced his retirement? It had to be heartbreaking. Yes, it, it truly was because here was a guy who didn't want to quit, who was relatively in the, his mid thirties, I believe, still at the time, and he could have gone, still wrestled if his health wasn't at stake here, but he was just forced to, and this is where a problem lies with Daniel Bryan. <laughs> um. When Talking Smack happened before it got cancelled as a weekly episode, Daniel Bryan's kind of adopted this character persona, or at least just said, you know what, I'm gonna say whatever I want. I don't care because I want to get fired. I want to wrestle again, and I'll wrestle somewhere else because a lot because Bryan has been hinting that once his contract is up with WWE sometime next year or something. Um, he's going to move to like Ring of Honor or New Japan Pro Wrestling. Oh, I mean, see, uh, see, this where where I don't get it. I mean, his health should be concerned. I mean, uh, well, here's the thing: um, Michaels had a, a a a very serious back injury. Uh, between the Royal Rumble 1998 and WrestleMania 14. So they had him lose the WWE Championship to Stone Cold Steve Austin on that night. That was also on the same night where Iron Mike Tyson was the special guest referee. Uh, Shawn Michaels took a four-year hiatus off of wrestling until 2002 when they did that teaser DX reunion between the Triple H and that was also where Triple H uh, attacked him yeah and then Shawn Michaels returned to wrestling from there at SummerSlam yeah so I, I, don't, I don't know if the same thing will happen with Daniel Bryan well here's the thing there's a difference with a back injury and a serious concussion that's the big difference here yep there's a huge difference and Brian has been on on Talking Smack basically saying, yeah, I don't care. I'm going to wrestle one way or another, even if it kills me. And I'm going to do it outside WWE once my contract is up. Because uh, Daniel Bryan would say TNA. He would mention TNA a lot. And I'm like, I don't think WWE likes it when you talk about, their comp- about the other wrestling promotion. And... Then he would talk about Ring of Honor. Then he would basically reveal that Mick Foley did wrestle in TNA after he had left WWE. And he was not punished for it because they can't do a thing to him. unless uh, Other than keep him off television. But because he's so loved by the fans, they know, yeah, we're kind of shooting ourselves in the foot either way. So, 
Brian is basically doing this, I don't care, I don't give a damn, I get to say whatever I want, and here's the thing, I'm going to wrestle again, and I'm going to say it to the world. I mean, well, you know, that Brian can say just about um, anything, but, uh, but I, I, I also remember that Talking Smack episode where the mess called Daniel, Daniel Bryan, out. He called Daniel Bryan out for not uh, for not just calling the Miz a coward champion, but but for Daniel Bryan not not following his promise. I remember when the, when the Miz once went off on them on talk on talking smack. Yeah, I saw that and I was like. Okay, you might have struck a nerve to Daniel Bryan, and I think that's when the whole I don't give a damn anymore thing happened for him. (sighs) Yeah, it, it was... Yeah, like... There was an element of truth to what Miz was saying, but at the same time, I felt like... Yeah, was Dan Bryan informed of that this was going to happen, or was he just like, eh, I don't care. Like, it's the show, it gets to allow wrestlers to express themselves. But I think that they weren't, in- I don't think he anticipated that kind of comment, even though there was a huge concern for his health. And I think I when. Mean, huh? Oh. Oh. Oh, no, you can uh, go. Oh, no, uh, don't mean to interrupt, but. Judging by that level of Daniel Bryan's feelings, it, it kind of seemed like what Miz was said to him first came across as out of the blue. Yeah. Well, Alexa, there was something Alexa Bliss once said about about Talkins back. Uh, she she said that on well, Talkins back, I mean, you, you can say what. I mean, you can say whatever you you want. I I, I think she, I think she she cleared it up. Yeah. And now, like Brian has been like secretly trying to find a way to get out of WWE and go back to like Ring of Honor or New Japan Pro Wrestling. And even Bree, his wife, has said that she is certain Daniel Bryan will wrestle again. And I'm thinking, like, Bryan, this isn't the same thing as Shawn Michaels. You didn't have a back injury. You had a severe concussion. Do you want to end up like the certain Voldemort of wrestling now? Daniel Bryan once said he had ten concussions. Ten of which were undocumented. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I don't want to take a step foot in a wrestling ring again. Yeah, that, yeah, I believe so too. I believe that Dan Bryan shouldn't wrestle, like, at all if his health is that in, in, at stake. Because the last time that things went unchecked when a wrestler got a concussion, we had the Chris Benoit disaster. Oh, 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 yeah, I, oh, yeah, I, I, I remember. I mean, I, I, I honestly don't know what the specific reasons are of why Chris Benoit did what he did, first taking the lives of his wife and son before, uh, uh, uh before hanging himself. Yeah, like, there were reportedly a lot of factors that got went into it, like, some say he was taking medicines, he was taking drugs, and then it was reported that his brain was damaged, like, severely, like, they thought he had, like, they thought, like, he would, like, MVP, Montez Vegas Porver, I'm pretty sure I got that wrong, MVP, huh? I said, uh, Montel Vontavious Porter. Yeah, he said Chris Benoit would black out, 
And this led to people speculating that Chris Benoit may have had a blackout due to his numerous concussions and his damaged brain. That he might have not knowingly killed his family. And um, this led to him in this destructive state of guilt just hung himself and whatnot. Like That's the version people like to believe because they can't really imagine Chris Benoit would willingly do such a thing. After such, like, years of happiness that he had with them. And he had a son who wanted to be like him, to an extent. Like, I don't know the full story, and we probably never will, but... Yeah, I get the str- strong feeling that concussions had a, had, a, had a role in all this. Yeah. A lot... A, a lot... Or I think steroids may have something to do with what he did too. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, and since the news about this broke out, I, I, I believe that was one of many reasons why Vince McMahon made the WWE TV PG, and and why people don't hit each other. On the heads with chairs anymore. Yeah, which I totally understand. Like, if I want to watch a violent version of wrestling, I'll just go to the independent scenes. If WWE doesn't want to do chair shots anymore, if WWE doesn't want to do blood anymore, as much as I'll miss it, I'll to- I totally understand why. But a lot of people have said that it wasn't because of that. They kept saying it was because of Linda McMahon going into politics. And I was like... Say if that's true, that kind of makes Dudley look like this callous, self-centered, egotistical individuals in the company. At, at, at first, I thought Linda was trying to make, I mean, to make her, to make her husband's company look good. Yeah, that that's that was also one that's said to be one of the contributing factors of the PG era to some people, but I get if Chris Benoit was the foundation for it, Linda McMahon having the political gaining wanting to gain politics stuff, that might have had something to do with it, but yeah, she the fact that she failed the Senate twice and had to basically get a lend from a certain somebody who I do not wish to talk about because if I go into politics I might as well piss everybody off on the internet. Oh. Oh, oh, oh. I, I, I respect that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, with everything going on nowadays, I, I just try to stay away from the political stuff. If I talk about politics, I'm pretty sure I'm going to get a lot of unnecessary hate for having an opinion. Yeah, I mean, pol- politics is, is what I try not to not to impose on, any, on anyone else. Yeah, so... Okay, moving on from that part. So, like... Yeah, the whole... I get the feeling like there's a huge chance, and I seriously hope not, that Daniel Bryan is risking everything on the line just to satisfy his need to wrestle again. And I get the feeling like if he continues going out to wrestle again and does dangerous stunts again in the wrestling business after he leaves WWE, we might have another problem on our hands. Oh. I mean... I, 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 I truly hope Dave Ryan is convinced to do what what Edge was told to do, what Shawn Michaels was told, I mean, to do. And I mean, that's I mean, Shawn Michaels and Edge have have fully stayed away from wrestling after they told after they were told they couldn't wrestle anymore that they, they had to retire. I remember when Shawn Michaels and Edge retired. Yeah. I, I truly hope Dan Bryan does the same by staying away from that ring. Or any wrestling ring in general. Mm-hmm. And 
Shawn Michaels, he just had a bad back injury, and he managed to recover and continue and finish his career on the way he wanted it. But Edge, he had a spiral injury where he could die in the ring if he did if they did the ladder match with Alberto Del Rio. And Daniel Bryan has a severe concussion issue that could lead to certain disasters like what happened with Chris Benoit. Uh-huh. Yeah, so... Now, uh, I, I, I've seen people get paralyzed in this ring. I've seen some... Yeah. It, it's been... It was unfortunate on I that. Mean, the, 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 the ring isn't something to be taken lightly. Yeah, I agree. I mean, uh, oh, 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 it's true. I, I, I've heard about some wrestlers dying in a ring. Like, for example, you remember, you remember what happened in 2015 with... Um, Ray Mysterio's tag team partner. Yeah, I he- I heard about guy. that. What did you say? Yeah, I heard about that incident. I was like, oh, oh god, oh god, oh god. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it it happened with Owen Hart. Yeah, and Owen Hart. Yeah, that was a touchy day for everybody, and. If I was in charge, I probably would have stopped the show. Like, I get people paid money, but considering that someone just died in the ring, I would have stopped the show. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I was four years old growing up on that time when I watched that event. I, 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 I mean, I, I remember asking my my brother uh, I mean, uh, uh, about... About, I, I remember asking my brother what happened with, I mean, with Owen Hart. My, my, my brother, I can tell, I saw my brother had a really uncomfortable look on his face because uh, they weren't, they weren't showing, um, they weren't showing anything but Owen Hart besides footage of him as the blue blazer in an interview until Jim Ross came with this devastating news saying that he had the unfortunate response response of somebody that uh, passed away yeah I remember seeing that on the internet like we didn't like no one ever saw the fall because thank god no one had the audacity to try and find that footage and then they did confirm they do have one footage of that scene, but they said they would never release it, thank God. But, um, I always felt like those who want to see the footage of Owen Hart's death, I mean, like, it kind of goes without wanting to see it. Like, it's kind of morbid that you want to, that people want to see it. But, I'm like... <sighs> and then something happened. Speaking of Neville, regarding Owen Hart... Do you remember a commentary? Do you remember when Booker T was doing commentary one night when Neville was wrestling? Do you remember what Booker T said about Neville when they were comparing him to Owen Hart? Oh, uh, could you tell me what he said? Okay, it's been. Uh, I like to first point out that it's been known that Vince McMahon is the one making everyone say the lines in the script. So, in the in, when it comes to commentary, so this is what Vince McMahon told Booker T to say. Gravity didn't forget Owen. I, I, I believe that was a very ill place. That was ill time. I didn't think it was a. I didn't think it was appropriate to mention that. It yeah. just wasn't a good time. It, this was in 2015. I must stress, and Vince just told Booker T to say that on television. Why, why, why would he tell him to say that? Because Vince wanted to compare Neville to Owen Hart in terms of their athleticism and their natural ability of high flying, but I don't get why Vince had the 
brain capacity to say gravity didn't forget Owen. I'm like, um, you do remember what happened that day. You were there, Vince. Are you this forgetting of everything that happened in the past that you are this callous? Or are you just not caring anymore? I mean, I, 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 I thought that was, uh, at, at first I thought he was out of his mind. Yeah. I mean, I mean I, 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 there, there's no reason to compare these, these guys. I mean, the, these guys are from different eras. I mean, with different abilities. Oh, I mean, Owen Hart was, I mean, was more, uh, was more of a in-ring technician on the mat. Yeah. And Neville was a high-flying uh, wrestler, while well, with some technicals, but he was mostly high-flying. That's correct. And I don't. I don't really complain a lot when wrestlers are when the commentators have to compare a wrestler to another past wrestler. It's more like this one particular instance. I thought, yeah, uh, back out. You're going too far with this. Like I, I get that wrestlers can't be like the guys from the past, like Shawn Michaels and Seth Rollins comparison. I thought, okay, Seth Rollins is Seth Rollins. He is not the second coming of Shawn Michaels. That's impossible. I I, I don't even see any of Shawn Michaels and Seth Rollins anyway. Yeah. And they even addressed Uh, that on television once. Yep. A a lot of people... I I, I don't see John Cena and Roman Reigns. I don't see... Undertaker and Bray Wyatt. Yeah. Uh, oh. Seth Rollins is the first and only Seth Rollins. Yeah. I mean, like, I, I jokingly make to say the statement, like, the only person that can make a replication of somebody is... Hulk Hogan and John Cena, and even then, that's very stretching the term, because I felt like, okay, they don't really have anything in common wrestling-wise, because Hulk Hogan wasn't really much of a wrestler, John Cena's more of a wrestler, it's more like, yeah, the egos kind of have too much similarities, That that's the only similarity they did. And, and the difference between right now and then is, uh... The ring depends on a lot, lot more endurance and cardio. And, I mean, John Cena, the, the, John Cena doesn't you doesn't just use his strength; he, he uses his endurance, his speed. I, I see many videos of him working on his strength, cardio, and endurance. You you see a lot of wrestlers do that. I, I I've also I've also seen. Many videos of Cesaro performing not just Olympic Olympic lifts. He uh, he does endurance too. He does profit like Seth Rollins does. Yeah, and speaking of Cesaro, okay. Did you ever watch? Did you ever watch the Stone Cold podcast with Vince McMahon? Uh, oh, 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 yes. I mean, that was a dark day after what Vince told Stone Cold Steve Austin about Cesaro, saying that Cesaro was European, Cesaro's verbal skills weren't that great. And he was boring, and I'm like, Vince, okay, Uh, this is metaphorically speaking, but you're digging your legacy into the ground. And... After that, everyone wanted to see Cesaro just spin Vince around and beat him up in a dream match. Even I kept saying, like, okay, Vince, if you think Cesaro is boring, how about you get in the ring with him and see how boring he can be? I'm like, 
Ignore the Cesaro section signs that are all over the place. Ignore the ravenous cheers everyone gives him. Oh, he's boring because Cesaro labels himself as a wrestler, not a sports entertainer, because wrestling is the demon of all things to Vince McMahon. That term is vile to him, which I, to this dairy day, don't understand. Yep. I, I bet, I bet, I bet a lot of people wanted to ring Vince McMahon's neck when they said that, I mean, Cesaro was boring. Uh, I mean, C- C- Cesaro won a lot of people with his strength and technique way before he became a WWE superstar. There's nothing C- Cesaro can't do. Yeah. And Vince, like... Uh, yep. Yeah. Uh, I mean, not just that. I thought, I thought Vince was talking out of his butt when he said Cesaro was boring. Yeah, I was seriously hoping, like, please, Vince, please tell me your brain just went out for a second because you could not have been serious about this. And sure enough, as we saw the months pass after that podcast. Cesaro started getting less TV time. He started getting more losses. They banned his swinging maneuver because it was too entertaining for the fans. And I'm like, just turn him to a good guy and let him do what he wants. Because that's who Cesaro is. He's a wrestler. He's not a sports entertainer. He's not the guy on the mic. He's a wrestler. He's always been a wrestler. But Vince... Hates that word. He hates anything that has to do with the word wrestling, even though his company revolves around wrestling. Yes. WWE stands for World Wrestling Entertainment. Yeah, and... Okay, this might be stretching it, but I have a theory about why Vince hates the word wrestling. As long as I live, I'll, I'll, I'll never understand why he hates it. Yeah, here's the thing. There was, okay, back when I, I bought the first ever WWE Encyclopedia book and went into Vince's past, apparently Vince never wanted to be a promoter. He didn't want to be a businessman. He wanted to be a wrestler, but his dad told him no and told him, no, you're being a promoter. You're being a, you're being a businessman. And I'm thinking like, wait. Please tell me that this is not stemming from your resentment towards your dad. Because if this is, Vince, you are the most pettiest person I have ever met, I have ever heard in my entire life. Well. That, I mean. I mean, that that kind of. Uh, kind of had me at a loss there for, a, I mean, for a, for a second. Yeah, I bet. Um, um, I mean, Vince McMahon likes a lot more talking on the microphone. Than, I mean, than wrestling. Uh, nowadays, WWE is more towards promos and talking than, than than matches. Yeah, and and then look at Triple H's NXT. It's more veered towards wrestling than it is talking. Like, they do talking from time to time, but they mostly focus on the wrestling. Whereas main rosterville, they focus more on talking than wrestling. Yep, I I, I understand. I, 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 I understand that, well, it's true. Both NXT and WWE uh, want to depend on character development, but not everybody can talk. There are some who can talk, and there are some who can wrestle. And both is better. I mean, at talking than at wrestling. Yeah. And I mean, well, Cesaro is is better at wrestling than talking. 
Yeah, but because he's a wrestler, that apparently means he's the scum of the earth to Vince. Yep. And, and if I'm right, and this stems from the fact his daddy didn't give him what he wanted, I'm going to just, just say he's the pettiest person I've ever, ever had the pleasure of hearing in the wrestling business. Well, 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 that's what he'd be if that were the case. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, I, I, when I read that, I was like, oh, oh, please. Uh, uh, like, okay, that's interesting. Vince will always want to be a wrestler. But as years went by, and I still remember that pr- line in the book, I was like, okay, wait. Vince wanted to be a wrestler, but his dad said no. But... And then there's Paul Heyman saying that in the promo back in 2001, saying, You made wrestling a dirty word, Vince. And I'm like, Did. Is Vince getting back his father for some petty vendetta? And then I would like to also say, Vince, you did technically wrestle. You wrestled in some big matches for big storylines, like with Triple H, with Stone Cold Steve Austin, with Shawn Michaels. You got what you wanted. So why do you have to be this self-centered in your own desire to get back at your dad, who you bought the company from and built a global empire with? Well, that's that's he does what he thinks is best for business, and, I mean, and not for the fans. Yeah. And yet, I always try to see, okay, I get that the fans can't always get what they want, and I get the company has can't always get what it wants, so why not just make a balance of it? The fans are satisfied, the company is satisfied, but no, that's impossible. It has to be one way or the other to fan, to people. Well, Raw doesn't have to begin with a 20-minute promo all the time. Agreed. I mean, about, about, about after five or ten minutes, uh, I, my brain kind of goes into a fog because I'm starting not to understand what the point of the story is anymore. Yeah, and here's the thing. I showed my friends Payback back last year. I showed them on the WWE Network. I was watching Payback with them. When they they were liking the show so far, the wrestling was good, even though they even though one hadn't watched wrestling in a while and the other one never does wa- never has watched wrestling. But when we got to the Vince McMahon, Shane McMahon, and Stephanie McMahon segment, they went on their phones because it was taking for so long. Wow. Yeah, like the only reason why I was watching that promo for as long as it was was because I had to talk about it in my YouTube channel. So basically, yeah, I'm basically torturing myself with Vince McMahon making ir- making no sense in his words. Uh, I mean, I, I know a lot of people want against to go away. Yeah, like, I want Vince to step down. I don't want him to die to get rid of him because that's excessive and over the top. I just want him to realize... He's overstayed its welcome. I think it's best he steps down from power and just hands it to Triple H. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Triple H is a wealth of, I mean, of knowledge. And I think with his guidance and expertise, he can lead the company towards a, a, a much better perspective. 
Yeah. But sadly, Vince doesn't think that way and instead opts for more uh, promo time, 20 minute promos. We got to recap everything that happened because we think the fans are completely stupid for some strange reason. We're insulting their intelligence. Like, here's the best way to describe Vince McMahon as he currently is. It's about as bad as WCW 2000. Like, the product, not, not, not like that, but Vince McMahon's mindset, it seems to be as bad as WCW 2000. They think the fans are stupid and will just fall for anything because, oh, it's the only, it's the biggest game in town. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and... It's- yeah, it's a miracle that Vince is ha, still has this big legacy, even though he's kind of muddied it a bit. Mm-hmm. Yep, they have to. They also need a, a much better bal- a balance between promos and wrestling. I I, I, I remember one uh, one of the words promos that I'll never forget. Like for example, that promo from Titus O'Neil, where he was stuttering. Uh, I mean, in some parts of his promos against Darren Young and Bob Backlund. Yeah, I remember that promo. I like. I was like, oh, oh wow, um, oh oh god, th- this is horrible. And okay, I I'm going to say this, but I'm pretty sure the only one who liked that promo was Vince McMahon because Vince McMahon hates Titus O'Neil. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll never forget that night. That night was Daniel Bryan's retirement. Yeah. Where Vince, um, where Vince apparently shoved Titus O'Neil after Titus O'Neil um, asked Vince McMahon to let uh, ladies, I mean, to let Stephanie McMahon uh, go by first. Yeah, and and and, and Titus O'Neil was reportedly trying to do it as an act of chivalry, like he was trying to be nice. But Vince, oh, you touched me, suspended. <laughs> oh, you want to know the big kicker out of this? You want to know this big big thing that was reported after when Titus O'Neil was suspended? Okay, uh, okay, what's the big kicker? Vince McMahon wanted to fire him. Yeah, and then it gave him 90 days, then it turned to 60 days. Yeah, and guess who talked him into it? Triple H talked him into it because he said, Vince, this is kind of a stupid idea. Can you just suspend him, not fire him? Like, I'm like, granted, he did nothing wrong, but still... Don't you think firing is a little excessive? I mean, WWE superstars have not just themselves, they have their families to feed. Yeah. And I get when a budget cut happens, I I get why they can't keep these guys who have families. Like, if a budget cut happens, it's you have to just pray on luck that you don't get terminated from your contract. But when Vince is walking around thinking he has a god complex to the point that if someone touches him, oh, I'm going to ruin their life, essentially. Weren't you, um, I believe Vince McMahon wrote Titus O'Neil's awful promo for him. I mean, the fans weren't responding. They said something like CM Punk and we want Slater. They want Heath Slater. Yeah.
And I, I mean, sorry. Well, oh, oh wait, I mean, yeah. I mean, I mean, the pro wasn't responding with anything until almost after the promo. Yeah. It was pretty bad. And the fact that this happened months after Titus O'Neil was suspended and after the incident, it just comes across further as Vince being extremely petty over something. That wasn't really a big deal. I, I, I thought a lot of people wanted to see Titus O'Neil succeed. I mean, she's a former tag team champion. Yeah, and like Titus O'Neil finally found his his niche with being a manager now. Like, I didn't really think of him being great as a wrestler. He was good on the mic, but I didn't think he was good as a wrestler. I mean, yep, a lot of people saw him as as clumsy and slow and not know what he was doing. Yeah, and the fact that, like, I, I feel like Titus O'Neil now is doing much better being a manager and guiding these Cruiserweight, guiding Akira Tozawa and Apollo Crews, though, of course, Apollo Crews has been, van- have vanished, essentially, but... Yeah, it's part of Titus, Titus Worldwide. Yeah, I feel like that's actually his, I think he's finally found his place now, and it's looking like he's actually having fun again. Yeah, and yeah, Vince uh, when when I had told people on my YouTube channel about the Titus O'Neil suspension, someone in the comments actually had said that please tell me this was a storyline because there is no way that Vince is this, this incompetent. And then I had to explain to them it's not. Vince wanted to fire him but Triple H talked him out of it. But because Tyus O'Neill was trying to be a nice guy and let Stephanie be be ladies first to go to get to the back, apparently Vince just looks at him like he's some sort of big monster. And when he turned heel after we had seen all of his charity work, it just came across as what? Like, couldn't you keep him a good guy? Like, everyone loves him being a good guy. Why turn him heel? I don't think they should have broken up the primetime players either. Yeah. Like, at least they were doing something with that, but when they wanted to give Bob Acklin back into the WWE for some reason, and the whole make Darren Young great again, which we all know was a play on make America great again, but like I said, I'm not going into that. But, um, yeah, I just thought, what's the point of this? What's the end result? Why are we even doing this? Why is WWE even doing this? But... Yeah, unfortunately, that storyline became a joke. It became immediately unforget, unfor, I mean, it became immediately forgettable. Yeah, and the fact that they had, and here's the th- here's the thing that really makes the storyline very sad. It's when Tyus O'Neil points out the obvious of when was Darren Young actually great in in WWE. He probably had a chance with the Nexus, but thanks to Cena, we can't have that. We couldn't have that. So, Darren Young never reached a high point in his career in WWE and went to a decline. 
It never happened. I just thought it was a failure to begin with. They failed miserably with that storyline. Yeah, I, I never understood it, and I probably never will. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm, I'm just like, but why was the storyline? What was the point of it? Like, it was such a waste of time. Like, they could have given character development to us to another wrestler. They could have given more wrestling time. But no, we have to have this Darren Young promo with Bob Backlund that makes no sense, adds nothing to the stories, adds nothing for the character, and just makes it a complete waste of time. I felt that they, that they could have done that they could have done much better. They they could have focused solely on Darren Young as a redeeming character. I, I didn't think the addition of Bob Backer was necessary. They could have done a lot better with Darren Young by redeeming his game. Yeah, and of course, they can't do that because... Because the company, for some reason, hates the fans for some reason. Yeah, that, that's my only guess. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, it, uh, well, it, it's harder to get the fans t- to react now than it was 10 or 20 years ago. It's harder to get them to, to say or do anything. Yeah. I've been wondering why that is. Yeah, I, I've always wondered, like, back then, Russ, when Daddy was on television, the fans reacted to virtually everything. They always cheered. They always flashed their cameras. Every every action that every wrestler and, co- and character on television did, everyone made a reaction out of it. But nowadays, when the PG era happened and all these restrictions start coming in, all of a sudden, those those cheers just died down, and they only became exclusive for certain people. Well, I I I, I don't think it's the talent's fault. I think it's a creative fault because they WWE has had a habit of using the same stars to the point of overexposure. Yeah. I mean, that's why I'm being given the underutilized talent a chance. I believe that's one of the reasons why Cesaro hasn't become a world champion yet. Yeah, and... And here's the thing, when WWE goes ahead and starts relying on the past wrestlers from by, from a bygone era, it just makes me think, yeah, you're doing what WCW did. You're over-relying on the established veterans instead of relying on the future. And we all know how that worked out for WCW. Well, mm-hmm. well uh, I think the WWE is becoming a little more uh, lenient now because most of the superstars from the new from the new era, or I mean, are champions. I mean, like for example, one of the most um, unexpected uh, unexpected stories was Alexa Bliss being the first woman to have held 
the Raw and SmackDown women's titles, but but she was never a champion in NXT. Yeah. Yeah, right. yeah, that was actually interesting. And I'm like, if they had let her win the NXT Championship, she could have been the first to hold all three titles, and that actually would have been awesome. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I, I don't know if she'd be brought to the main roster so, I mean, so soon, especially after they hadn't used her in, in a takeover match. A manager for Pink and Murphy. Yeah. Maybe, uh, uh, maybe I don't know. Maybe it's it, it's from watching um her idols, Trish Trish Stratus and Rey Mysterio's matches, and especially watching the action from Blake and Murphy, that that she started to become a a, a, a really good wrestler. Yeah, I believe it's it's, it's the advice she's taken from coaches Matt Bloom, known to the world as Albert or A Trainer Tensai. I believe she's also taking advice from William Regal, Triple H, and Coach Sarah. Yeah, I believe it. I believe it's her experience overall in in, in athletics, which she's participated in. She was since she was five. I, I believe. I, I believe that's why she's she's as good as she is. Yeah, I mean, like. If this, if she was around WWE ten to twenty years ago, about ten years ago, I really don't know where Alexa Bliss would be if this was the old WWE, because WWE at the time did not really rely on women as athletic wrestlers. They were more like sex objects. And I mean, and and what? Yeah. You're, you're right about that. They, they were seen as sex objects and eye candy. They they weren't relied on for their athletic abilities. Yeah, and the exceptions that were made well, was mostly Trish Stratus and Lita. Uh, change a little when they had Trish and Lita uh, main event Raw back in 2004. Yeah, and then that well, just that, stopped. And then it just went downhill from there. They, they they gave the women much much shorter TV time. Yeah. And here's the thing: I think the original plan after Lita and Trish Stratus' main event match on Raw. I think the original plan was for Lita to hold on to that title until WrestleMania, where she would face Trish Stratus again. And I firmly believe to this day they would have stolen the show. But then Lita got hurt beforehand. I mean, the injury can lead to a huge change of plans. Yeah, and then they went forward with Mickey James and and Trish Stratus, which was a good storyline, but it just wasn't the same with without Lita and Trish Stratus fighting. Uh, it, 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 yeah, it was said that they had to retire in the same year. Yeah. That, I mean, that's what that, that, that was when things started to go downhill. This was, like, for example, Gail Kim left WWE because the women weren't being used to their full, fullest abilities. Yeah, and Gail Kim recently said in an interview that Vince hates women wrestling. Yeah, um, I don't get the logic with that, like, 
if Vince hates women's wrestling, then why does he hire them? I mean, you're just like me. I have no idea. Yeah. I just hope yeah. Vince's opinions have changed since then. Yeah, and now I'm also wondering, wait, if Vince still hates women wrestling, why is he giving the green light to do the Mae Young Classic? I don't know if, if it was his idea or Triple H's idea. Most likely Triple H's, like the Cruiserweight Classic was Triple H's idea, then the Mae Young Classic is Triple H's idea, and probably Stephanie's. And Vince just said, okay, just do whatever you want, because... I don't know. I don't really give a care anymore, or to that extent, I just he just doesn't care, or Triple H and Stephanie do because oh they haven't you they haven't made a huge mistake yet. Well, maybe doing better than me, but that's beside the point. But um, yeah. And okay, the Cruiserweight wrestlers. Okay, what? Okay, remember when the Cruiserweights made their debut on Raw? Oh, I mean, oh, yes, this was months after. I mean, this was about weeks, a few weeks after the Cruiserweight Classic ended. Yeah, and they had an awesome Fatal 4-Way match. Yeah. Yeah. Here's the thing. Just a few days after that show, no one was injured in that match, I must stress, but here's the thing, Vince McMahon made the order to water the cruiserweights down, limit their kicks, their high-flying maneuvers, in order to, quote, lower the risk of injury, but at the same time, you just strip their identity away. I understand he's, he's trying to, uh, to have less and less and less injuries, but at the same time, you're, limit, you're limiting their liberty to develop their identities. Yeah, and now look at the Cruiserweights. 205 Live isn't doing so well, and the only saving grace is Neville. Yeah. I mean, it, I mean things got even worse when they released Austin Aries. Yeah, I had been wanting to make a video about that, but Austin Aries... But here's the thing. Austin Aries was the one that requested his release. WWE didn't want to let him go. But Austin Aries wanted to leave because he didn't want to be a cruiserweight. He wanted to be with the top guys. Because he was a world champion in TNA. He should be contending for the world title in WWE. But WWE has this mentality of, oh, if it didn't happen here in the company, then it didn't happen. And well, yeah, Austin Aries left I, the WWE that day. Uh -huh. Well, I mean, there, there are some people who, I mean, who, who live much better lives on the independent circuit than they did in WWE. Like, for example, Cody Rhodes. Cody Rhodes once tweeted out that he makes a lot more money with the independents than he ever did with WWE. Yeah, I get the feeling money wasn't much of a factor for him leaving. It was more like he wanted to do this, but WWE didn't want him to do that. In fact, Cody Rhodes actually had all wanted to do this idea. And this actually would have been actually pretty cool. You, you want to know what Cody Rhodes wanted to do? What did he want to do? He wanted to use the Stardust gimmick on Raw and Cody Rhodes on SmackDown during the brand extension. Oh. Yeah, he wanted to do a split personality angle where one persona is on Raw and the other is on SmackDown. Someone from the creative team actually proposed this to Cody and he said, Oh yeah, that's actually awesome. Let's do it. And then Vince came in in his infinite wisdom and said, Yeah, no, we're not doing that. Well, well, what 
there, it's kind of, it kind of, it kind of reminded me what happened um, back during the 2002 grant extension. Like, for example, I mean, com compared to now, back in, in the 2002 grant extension, there was actually an undisputed champion, Triple H, at the time, and he appeared on both brands. Yeah. I mean, uh, they just went to the idea of having two separate uh, world championships instead of having a an, an undisputed champion. Yeah, and then they somewhat wanted to replicate this again, but with Cody Rhodes' split personality gimmick they could have done, but Vince McMahon said no to that idea, and I do not know why. That would have actually been interesting. I believe that's Cody Rhodes requested his release. Yeah, and when I heard Cody Rhodes had requested his release from WWE, and when I learned all the details that went on behind the scenes, I was like, Cody, you can leave. Like, I want him out. I want him out of the company because. If he's not happy, he's not being creatively expressing himself in the ring, then he should take his talent and go somewhere else. And sure enough, he has succeeded expectations in, in the independent scene. He's a part of Bullet Club. He's the Ring of Honor World Champion. He's currently one of the top hottest free agents going on. And... All this stems from the fact that WWE refused to let him have creative freedom. Yeah. I I, I believe I, I believe that must have left that must have left a better taste than WWE's mouth. I believe WWE must be really quick jealous and bitter about Cody Rhodes' success now. Yeah. And... And then they start hiring back a lot of the guys they let go when they start making names for themselves back in the independent scene after they had left. Like, Drew McIntyre was Drew, Ma J Drew Galloway, and he comes back, and he's NXT champion now, and he's doing a lot better than he was when he was in 3MB. Uh, Ginger Mahal was let go, then he comes back, and he's suddenly WWE champion. Still surprised by that. And... I'm not surprised they brought back Cash's own no too. Yeah, the reason why they let him go the first time was because of his weight, and and his and, and his and his um unwillingness to uh, his condition. Yeah, and then it was reported that he only got worse with his weight, and I'm like, well, then why did you bring him back? Well, my hope to do better with him now than I did back then. Yeah, I hope so too. But the fact that he refuses to change to change his diet, it's not like the case with Kevin Owens. Whereas Kansas Ono is more, or Chris Harris, he's more popularly known as. Um, yeah. I, I get why Daddy wants him to be more cardioid and more endurance into him. And I get his independence schedule was much different. But I'm like, Chris, uh, you do realize you have a bright future here. You just need to up your diet a bit. And wrestling. I mean, look at I mean, look at Mick Foley. Mick Mick Foley, what what wasn't muscular by a long shot, 
but he could move. I mean, this, the same goes for Kevin Owens. I mean, Mick, Mick Foley lasted very long in, in a ring for a guy his size. Yeah. The same goes for Kevin Owens. Yeah, and here's the thing. Kevin Owens was originally said to win the U.S. Championship back at Battleground in 2015, but because he didn't have a certain weight or a certain size to him or looked muscular, they decided, you know what, uh, screw him, let's give it back to Cena. Let's make Cena the star again. And I'm like... You're kidding me, right? And, okay, um, you do, okay, you, you are aware that Kevin Dunn is said to be in charge of all the cameras in WWE? Yeah, 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 the grading, I find to be kind of demeaning. He had to what? Well, I kind of, uh, I had, I mean, I had to, I had to, I kind of find this not winning because it's not because of weight to be kind of degrading. Yeah, um, Here's the thing. I initially had a little skeptic on that. I did think Kevin Owens might have been sabotaged, but I didn't think it was because of his way. I think it was because he's from the independent scene and he made a name for himself there and not be WWE homegrown. But here's the thing. It's been known that Kevin Dunn is in charge of all the cameras and all the production stuff. And there was this moment on Raw where Kevin Owens was walking down the stage... And the camera didn't focus on him for a moment. It just lingered on this fan sign saying, Fat Owens Fat. It just lingered on that for a long while. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Wow. Yeah, and Dunn has been said to be in charge, has been known to be in charge of the camera stuff. Like, they, like, Triple H wanted, wanted, um, the shield to step over Triple H's body after payback, and Kevin Dunn said, no, I'm not doing that, but ultimately agreed anyways. And then he, like, cut the camera away from it for a second, and then went back to it, and tried to position it in a way that you couldn't see Roman Reigns' boot over Triple H, which was an awesome scene. But, um, and then when it lingered onto the scene with Kevin Owens with a fan sign saying Fat Owens Fat and it wasn't focusing on anything but just that sign, I was like, done. You're digging, you're, you're committing career suicide. You are, com- like, you have a vendetta against Triple H because he doesn't like you. How about you prove to him that you can be trusted, you can be relied on, not be a petty little whiner who will make other lives miserable because, because Triple H doesn't, because one guy at the top doesn't like you. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I believe. I mean, these ideas could be really. They they really need more of of stars input because creative freedom should be more of a priority than before. Yeah, especially since the PGA kind of took away all the reasons to get a big cheap pop, like the blood, the steel chair shots. So now the wrestlers have to be more expressing of themselves as opposed to like they could have not done that back then.
Yeah, but with this PG era and all these key restrictions over the wrestlers, the fans just don't seem to want to cheer as much as they used to unless they're given a good reason to cheer. But um, lately, as Roman Reigns has been known, they don't want to cheer him. They want to boo him. And Roman Reigns is a hot button of a topic. Oh, oh, either way, I mean, he makes money. He sells merchandise. Yeah. And the only reason why they say Roman Reigns is the top merchandise seller is because they removed Cena and Brock Lesnar off the part-timer list. So if you add in the part-timers again, Cena is at the top and Roman Reigns is in a close third. But since they want to remove Cena and Brock Lesnar on the list, they make Roman Reigns the top. So I'm like, okay, just admit he's the third best seller. I'm like, that's an achievement in and of itself. But, yeah, Roman Reigns, when he beat The Undertaker and subsequently retired him, essentially, I was like, WWE, you failed now. Like, there is no way he's going to get cheered anymore. And that's why I thought they should have done tonight. They should have what? They should have turned him heel the next night. Yeah, and... Especially... After, yeah. Especially he, he said a few words. Uh, that, he, he was being booed for ten minutes. They wouldn't have him say anything. Yeah, and when I saw that, I was like, okay, do the heel turn, man. Just let Rory say some words and walk out. Just say something to piss the fans off. They did it. But then the next week they try to act like that never happened. Yep, I mean. And, and, and there's some of them who still say women can't wrestle. Yeah, I have been disputing that for years. Like, I have had. I am one. Uh, like, okay. This is what I said on Bleacher Report in the comments sections back when before they did the Facebook change. I said a wrestler doing the same moves over and over again never bothered me because there's been a ton of wrestlers that have done the same moves. Stone Cold had a limited move set. The Rock had a limited move set. But because Roman Reigns was being shoved down people's throats, that just made it more noticeable. But ultimately... The guy doing has had has had there's a there's a bunch of videos that show Roman Reigns having more than than just three moves that like people like to say he has because of his NXT days his FCW days but I always blamed it on Vince and the creative team because they didn't want a wrestler to be more fluid with their wrestling maneuvers instead they wanted to limit it for some strange reason. Um, 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 um. There are a lot of people who, who say that that a lot of people think that Roman sounds like he's reading from a script instead of sounding authentic. Yeah, um, I can't really dispute that because it has because Vince McMahon has been known to be the guy writing the scripts for Roman Reigns because he feels like he knows what's best for Roman Reigns. Because, like, okay, back in early 2015, there were three promos Roman Reigns had to do. One was the the Superman comparison promo. One was the Suffering Succotash promo. And the other one was Jack and the Beanstalk promo. All were written by Vince McMahon. I mean, <laughs> I can probably tell they were, given how out of touch Vince is. Yeah, and, and here's the thing that Vince wanted to do at one point with Neville. Okay, 
Oh, that mighty mouse thing. Yes. I thought that was the stupidest idea ever. Like, this is something that no one's ever heard of and has not been around since the 50s. And Vince is this stuck in the past that he's going to do that. Yeah, that yeah, a lot of people were mad about that. Well, um, well, 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 Neville's doing very well for, I mean, for himself right now. Me too. Mm-hmm. If they had done the Mighty Mouse gimmick for him. I would have said, nope, 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 his career is done. His WWE career is done. Just let him go. Just let him go back to the independent scene because there is no hope for him right now. Yep. They're doing a better job with Seth Rollins and the Ambrose now because... Uh, because last year, Dean Ambrose was the WWE champion, but but things things weren't the best for him. A lot of people thought him winning the WWE, WWE title and defending it was too predictable. Yeah. But now, yeah, but now Dean Ambrose is is now one of the Raw Tag Team Champions alongside Seth Rollins. And that's more unpredictable. I mean, which which is good. Yeah. Did you ever think that would happen? Okay. Somewhat, like, I predicted, like, okay, um, I wasn't expecting him to win the tag team titles. I honestly didn't expect that. I was expecting, like, maybe... Dean Ambrose would turn heel. Uh, uh, I was hoping he would too. Yeah, I, uh, because, because uh, I, I think he would sell a lot more heel than, than Babyface. Yeah, and and I really like Dean Ambrose as a heel because he's just more chaotically crazy. Like, he can't tap into John Moxley, his old persona back in the independence scene, because it'd be too violent for WWE television. But if he could just take a semblance of a little bit of that, then that would have been magic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but Dean Ambrose had to be watered down extensively. Like, I get why, because his character was deemed too violent for PG audiences. So, they had to change it up greatly. But they try to, like, keep the core elements of what John Moxley was into Dean Ambrose. But that can only work for so long, unless you go all out. Okay. Mm-hmm. A lot of, a lot of people, a lot of people b- believe that Seth Rollins' character would, uh, I mean, would, would probably be a generic babyface, but but it turns out it hasn't. I believe he's still keeping some parts of the personality he had three years ago after he after he turned on his brothers, Roman Reigns and and Dean Ambrose. Yeah, I've noticed. Just, yeah, I've noticed the tendencies of his heel run. Well, at least up, up before his WWE Championship run, but yeah, he, he he still exhibits some of his heel characteristics. I I I just hope I just hope their characters don't go down a negative slope. Yeah, I'm hoping for that too. But considering this is modern WWE, I would not be surprised if they screwed it up big time. Mm-hmm. I, a, a lot of, a lot more 
babyface characters have been getting booed recently, and I know Roman Reigns isn't the only one. It's also been happening to Bailey a lot more often. Yeah, and speaking of Bailey, when I had heard she was getting booed, I was shocked that Bailey is injured. Bailey is hurt. She's she's depressed, and Toronto is booing her because she wasn't the Bailey they remembered her being. And I'm like, is that really her fault, or is that the creative team's fault and Vince McMahon's fault? I'm pretty sure I'm going with the latter. And then you really noticed there was a huge problem when she was booed in NXT back in Brooklyn 3. Yep. She's been getting booed ever since she became the Raw Women's Champion back. Yeah, yeah earlier this year. Uh-huh. Like, I said this in a video, it shouldn't be that hard to get the Bailey character right. Just have her be happy-go-lucky with a sometimes an aggressive edge, and boom, you have a you have the character, Bailey written down perfectly. But for some reason, they took the formula and just threw it out the window. Yep. Yep. Bailey was even too scared to use a candlestick. A what? Yeah. And, and when I think of when I think of what happened, I would I just come to the realization that oh yeah, Vince happened. Well, I just felt that. They redeem her character. I think she should either go back to NXT or turn heel. Yeah, those might be the only two routes left for her because her face run is done for now. Mm -hmm. I, I, I believe the, the, the only person who can, I mean, who can still keep up momentum, regardless of whether she's a face or heel, I believe the only one, the only person who can keep the momentum going is Sasha Banks at the moment. Yeah, in fact, I was surprised Sasha Banks won the Raw Women's title because last year it was reported that the reason why Sasha Banks hasn't been given a long reign with the women's title was because Vince deemed her injury prone. I mean, Sasha's fought through pain several times. Yeah, but because she got injured once on the main roster, she's deemed injury prone by Vince, and therefore her career is probably not going to have a long title reign, at least. Maybe she's proven him wrong this time. Hopefully. But we'll have to wait and see at the No Mercy pay per view when the we'll have to see if Alexa Bliss regets back the Raw Women's title on the upcoming Raw and see how that goes. So, I hope that Yeah. I believe they should have waited for, for. They should have waited until this past July instead of this past April. Yeah. And I um, let's see. Uh, and Alexa Bliss like. I wanted her to be this conniving heel that manipulated Nia Jax in order to ascend to her throne, but they kind of did that, then stopped. Mm -hmm. 
I actually thought that would have been really interesting if they did that. But no, they didn't because, I don't know, that would have been too good. Uh, but if first Naya was there, then she wasn't. Yeah, and then when Naya was facing Alexa Bliss and Alexa Bliss was finding ways to get out of it, Naya would just come back and join her side again. And I'm like, is there a reason for this? But yeah, they never gave a reason why Nia Jax went back to Alexa Bliss after the rematches they had with each other. They they never did, so immediately I was like, well, they just gave up. Like, I would say they tried at the beginning, but then they just gave up, but I don't know when exactly they started. Um, okay, I mean, it, 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 it didn't have a clear direction either. Yeah. I mean, I I I thought they I thought they were gonna have her hold the title past SummerSlam. Yeah, I thought that too. But then when Sasha Banks won, I was like, why? I mean, like, I I don't like. I'm glad Sasha Banks won, but at the same time, I'm like, Alexa Bliss had everything going for her. She was red hot, so why, why drop the drop the title afterwards? I didn't think it made sense to begin with. Yeah, and that led me to think, like, wait, if Sasha Banks won the title, was Bailey supposed to win the title if she had not gotten injured? Well, um, even even if Bailey wasn't injured, I, 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 I wouldn't think she'd be winning the title uh, back. I thought they'd have to keep rebuilding Bailey's character before she got a chance at the title again. Yeah, I, I got that feeling too, but um, yeah, this wouldn't surprise me if Dudge rushed everything and just gave her back the title out, out of nowhere. But I, I don't know why they would do that because. It's confusing for me, but at the same time, I was like, yeah, I don't get it. Like, there was no story with Sasha Banks and Alexa Bliss, so why would they change the title with no storyline? Uh-huh. It, it's also because Alexa has a much stronger character than Bailey. Yeah. Yep. Mhm. Well. Mhm. I mean, I I try to appreciate wrestling as much as I can. Yeah. I try not to be try not to be negative about it because it's true that not not all that we don't always get what we want. Yeah. I try to be positive and cheer on my favorites, and Alexa is one of my favorites. Yep. Mhm. I'll be. I'll be. I'm. I'm not. I'm not a fan of her because because she's just another pretty face. Or, I mean, I'm just a fan of her because of her background and story. And how tough she is. Yeah, I've seen it on your Twitter. And all the uh, big letters you've made on Windows documents and sent it to her. I mean, mean, yeah, it's happened numerous times. Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, I, yep. Yeah, I, fir- I first wrote Windows. I first wrote letters to a Windows document back in December of last year. Yeah. Uh, I, I also did that because uh, because I have the courage to bring up the story of battling my depression. Yeah. I I've been there. I've I've been battling depression for ten and a half years. And if I was to guess, Alexa Bliss kind of gave you hope on that? Uh, yes. But she's also proven that, I mean, that you, that you can, that you can do anything if, if you just stay positive and stay on the path. I mean, she, I mean, she's, she's not just a wrestler. She's not just a pretty face. She's, she actually went through so much. She battled an eating disorder, anorexia, twice when she was in her teens. Yeah, I've read about that. Yeah, she she went through a lot when she was a teenager. Um, Okay. Uh, uh, what What was your reaction when you when you first heard her say it? Well, I'd be concerned. I mean, I mean, yes. So would I. Uh, a, a lot. A lot of people should learn about the dangers of those types of disorders. Yeah. Mhm. Uh, I mean, I'm I, I'm a huge fan of her because because of the struggles she's overcome, the hurdles she's had to jump over. Yeah, and she managed to win. Mhm. Uh, she managed to prove. I mean, she's has to prove to anybody that I mean that you 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 don't have to be what the, you don't have to be what society wants you to don't you don't have to uh, obey any preconceived notions about about what how a woman is supposed to look a certain way. You don't have to. You don't have to abide by a preconceived notion about that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you you, could, yeah, you you don't have to be like anybody else. You don't have to be like these women on the magazines. Those, I mean, those are the things um, Lexi has said in numerous interviews. Yeah. Like, I, I was picked on a lot back in school because I was, because I acted different from everybody else. Like, a lot of people wanted me to be like this. I didn't want to be like that. I just chose to not interact with them. And they did not like that. I had, I had, a, I had almost the same uh, problems. I mean, from 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 to this day. I, I, I was getting they made fun of because I, I, I was made fun of because of how overweight I was and I mean and the fact that uh, that a lot of kids thought I was I was a lot older than their ages 
I was made for, for how I for how I look and for being different. So you're not the only one. Yeah. I'm sure a lot of people can relate to what you had to go through. Yeah, I've actually talked about this with one of my friends on the first episode of the podcast where I was in a very dark place at one point and and the only way I could vent it out was through writing stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, I understand. At first, at first I, I was very hesitant about telling about telling my mother what I went through because I didn't, I didn't because I didn't think she'd understand or do anything to help me. But as I told her, I under I, I, I understood her a lot more. Yeah. Uh, uh, I mean the world. I mean the world should be a uh, more about encouragement and building people up instead of tearing them down. Yeah, but like nowadays, that's like asking for like the impossible. I have no idea why. I wish there was a way for everyone to just get along, but there's like this stubbornness in people that they just don't want to get along unless there's a huge benefit for them. I I don't get why. people were saying, hey Alexa, you gotta check this out, and then Alexa actually retweeted or shared the documents that you sent her? Um, uh, yes, that's true. Back, I mean, back in January, uh, Lexi, uh, once liked, uh, once liked a letter of mine which talked about, which talked about me having just gone through surgery. She once liked my letter about me having about me having just having just gone through a very serious surgery uh, because uh, uh, because it, because it's true uh, I mean uh, I I had a groin injury and had to get. Uh, surgery for it. I mean, I, I have to admit, I, I was, I mean, I was kind of shocked that I my letter about me going through uh, of surgery. But at the same time, I appreciate how kind and caring she is to her fans and supporters. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, because I know, I know she can relate to so many of our um, uh, s- stories, because uh, because going through injuries, recovering from them, isn't the easiest thing in the world to do. Yeah, especially when 
when the doctors tell her that you only have 24 hours left to live and you somehow manage to survive that and fight through it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, well, well, when I first, when I first got that uh, surgery for my groin injury, doctors told me I, I, I wouldn't be able to, uh, exercise for a few, for, for a few, but I took rock. Uh, I was I was only recovering for six weeks, not 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 a few months. I, I was able to get back to my CrossFit activities earlier than I expected, and what these doctors expected. Congrats. Mhm. Yep. Mhm. I was also able to catch up with my uh, college studies too. Uh, this, I mean, despite being at home. I mean, at, I mean, I was able to prove that e- even suffering from injuries can't stop me from pursuing. I mean, can't stop me for long for, from pursuing athletics or getting an or getting an education. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. My, my professor told me that I could complete the that I could complete the missing assignments home. And, and, and guess what? I actually ended up get, ended up getting A's in, in, in all my classes. All right. That does actually that's impressive. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I I mean I, I I didn't miss one single assignment. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. And it, it, yep. It's true. In in addition to CrossFit, I also take up boxing and yoga routines. I'm also a a psychology and sociology student. Yeah, I believe that said that on your Twitter bio how you're how you're getting a degree in sociology. I mean, yes, it's true. I've been pursuing it since November of ten. All right. And and, and right now I'm 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 almost done with it. All right. Mm-hmm. So, okay. Uh, oh, oh, what? Oh, uh, uh, you can go ahead and ask what you were gonna ask. Oh, I was gonna ask. Um, do you have any more? Do you have any final thoughts of what to say to the audience? Uh, could you repeat that? Oh, I said. Do you have any final thoughts of what you want to say to the audience? Family. 
appreciate the feedback and the advice of the smartest and wisest people in the world. All right. I think we can stop here. Um, well, everyone, this was Neo Reality Entertainment and Alexander the Great. Feel free to like, comment, subscribe, and donate to YouTube for more. We'll be seeing you next time. And, Alexander, you can sign us off. It was nice talking with you. All right. We'll be seeing you next time, everybody.